Hi, Sandro. Good evening. Hi. Yes. Hi. First question, obviously, in these very troublesome times. Um, how are you doing? I'm fine. Uh, yeah. Good health. I'm living this lockdown with my uh, family, my children, and my wife. Yeah. It's busy. I have no time for reading now. No. I had. I used to have the time but everybody now, thinks you have time now but you especially when you have children there's no time there's no time <laughs> i had in my normal life i had all the time i wanted for reading because kids were eight hours a day at school but yeah now in and you have to have to, to, to take care of them and whatever so i cannot concentrate on reading uh, important books, important stuff. I read, I read screenplays or short pieces. Um, and I don't write either. I don't write so much either. Just like short pieces. Okay. Are you, uh, are you being asked by newspapers or magazines or for the radio maybe to write short pieces about the situation or just whatever? Yes, but uh, what I can write is always the same so i wrote it on the corriere della sera once twice they asked they asked me a lot of video just yeah. to encourage reading or whatever and uh, it seems to me uh, really an irrelevant thing but they keep on asking me for this so i so i i say if they want this from me i will give this yeah of course it's it's not important for for fighting this virus, but it's, this is my my duty. I will I will do this. So I I record videos and uh, and Zoom interviews. Okay, but it's not it's not um, uh, I'm not focused. You know, no, no it, that's a strange thing of this whole situation that that even though you you seem to have all this time you don't go anywhere at night you don't have anything in the weekends you don't have to go to soccer practice with your children but still there's hardly any focus to 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 get a lot of things done in the, during the day yeah um, the only the only bad thing that i suffer of is uh that i don't sleep i i oh. I fall asleep very, very late. Okay. And um, since I don't want to take uh, medicines, yeah. I watch uh, wonderful, movies, oh. wonderful movies. What was the last night. one you saw? What was the one you saw yesterday or two days ago? Uh, it was Cape Fear, mm. Cape, the, the original with Robert oh, Mitchell very good. And, uh, and Gregory Peck. But there are a lot late yeah. at night because this is something really frequent. A lot of people don't sleep. Since you have not to get up at seven, no. just like normally, you can sleep a little more. So uh, for me, I'm not anguished or particularly worried, but I don't take my normal sleep at, at midnight or one. No, I understand. Later. Well, luckily uh, for the Dutch, um, it was the, your new book, The Colliery. Megan already mentioned it. This beautiful, beautiful book has been translated really quickly already in Dutch. So we are able to read it here. It was chosen uh, in a very important news show um, at uh, the Dutch television as one of the best books ever, basically, at least one of the best books of the last year. So congratulations on that. I, I can only agree. Um, in, in short, I will tell the people who haven't read the Colibri yet. It's very in, in very short. It's about Marco Carrera, uh, a man we follow throughout his life. But it basically, it's not in chronological order. It's basically you, you, you get him in certain points in his life. And he leads a very quiet life on the one hand. But on the other hand, it's very, very tragic. Uh, he's married. Uh, he's, he hasn't got a very good marriage. He's got a beautiful daughter. But he's basically, for all of his life, he's been in love with this one girl who uh, he's known from his childhood. And basically, they, they start to attract each other and they, they, they get away from each other all the time. And many, many horrible things, very human things happen to him. And I won't get into detail with it because people have to read it. And um, it's a beautiful book about a man, about faith, 
about uh, destiny, about um, basically trying to lead a normal life and withstand all the troubles human beings encounter throughout their lives. Um, and the first question about the book, uh, Sandro, because we follow this man's life, Marco Carrera, you haven't chosen to tell his life in a chronological order. You, you chose to get certain aspects of his life and write only mini stories about these aspects. Why did you choose this way of telling the story about this man? Well, you know, um, the chronological time is very familiar for us because mm -hmm. uh, that's the way we live our life. We live our life. And going forward, no return, in, 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 in an only direction. And this is always the, the, the most simple way of, of, of telling stories. But um, I knew about this story I was about to write, that it would have contained some point of extreme sorrow for the, for the character, but also for the readers. And I didn't want this sorrow to be too overwhelming uh, throughout the story. I am a very sensible reader. I would have standed with a lot of difficulties yeah. in this book, uh, the point when there is one of the tragedies, uh, if it would have been told in a chronological order. It would be and too so I thought, I thought that I could go on and back and on and back and the reader makes his idea that in the middle there is a tragedy. Yeah. He understands this. He expects it. And I didn't invent anything. Uh, it's um, sorrow and uh, pain and, and suffering and lasting suffering is a matter of time. How do you relate yourself with time? And there are beautiful novels, just like Child in Time by Ian McEwan. Wonderful. Or um, The Sweet the, uh, Hereafter by Russell Banks. Yeah. They, they are focused on a tragedy, unbearable, because in that case, are children, children dying. But the way of telling the story, going on and back, on and back, tasting the, the sweet hereafter, as Russell Banks mm -hmm. call it, the time that comes after the tragedy, tasting it and and discovering that there is a reality, that there still is life, there's, there still is energy, this can really help to, to face the tragedy and to enjoy the, the character who stands the tragedy without being overwhelmed. Because uh, uh, if the Marco Carrera is able to face the tragedy, it's not told that also, each reader is able to stand this. So in this way, I, I escape the uh, dictatorship of uh, the chronological time. And this is uh, uh, something that gave me a, 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 an idea of freedom that I never felt before. Is it also why you chose the motto of the, of the, of the book, I, I Can't Go On, I Will Go On, by Samuel Beckett? It's, it's about what you were saying. I mean, what, what happens to Marco throughout his life, and God forbid it will ever happen to people who are watching me or you and who have children. It's, um, he, he is faced with these, these horrible things in his life, but he still has to keep on, keep on living. Uh, he has to go on. How, how difficult was it for you, Sandro, to write about these things, especially when the children are involved? Or you have five children, I think? Yeah, now the children are two. Three oh, okay. sons. Yeah. Okay, I understand. The children now. 
But uh, I, I live with children since 29 years. Yeah. One or two or three. I always have children around uh, uh, in, in, in the last 29 years. So for me, it's really, uh, 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 as a prisons, children are really important in my life because uh, uh, half of my life has been shared in the space, the time uh, with children. So, of course, this touches me uh, particularly. And uh, yes, no, it's been tough, but everything I write is tough. Uh, it's not only a matter of uh, the item or, or the theme, uh, it's writing stuff because it's me. Uh, a universe that normally when I don't write, I don't, I don't touch. No. I am a writer only when I write, when I physically write. And if I write something painful, uh, it's tough. But even if I write something uh, joyful, it's tough. Because it, it belongs to that universe where I have to be better. I have to be worthwhile. And I know that I will, I will stay there for, for a while and then I will be back in my normal life where I'm not able to do anything remarkable, you know. So could it's painful say, for this. Could you say, Sandra, then, that's very interesting what you were saying. Could you say that Marco Carrera, but also, uh, for example, Pietro Palladini from Caos Calmo, those men, we have to take care of, of children to bring them forward into the future. Do you see them as sort of experiment, experiments for yourself, that they are better versions of yourself, how you could be or how you should be in, a, in an ideal world? Could, is, is that something you could say about your characters, Pietro and Marco? About Marco Carrera, yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, he is very different from me. In a lot of cases, he is the opposite. And but it, it is a, a opposite that a, attracts me, just okay. like magnets. You know, uh, he's a better tennis player than me. He's a better uh, poker player than me. He's uh, more patient. He 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 he's more strengthful than me, of yeah. course. But so it, I wanted this. I wanted yeah. this. I wanted to to portray a man that I, I admire, just like. I would have admired myself if I was that way, you know. Yeah. Pietro Palladini is is different because uh, I belong to Pietro Palladini much more than uh, to Marco Carrera. Pietro Palladini is me in a half of his behavior, and he is better than me, but also worse than me uh, in the other half. In what, what way is he worse than you, Sandro? In what way is he worse than you? I wrote, I wrote a second novel yeah. uh, to Delta explain Delta. where Pietro Palladini was worse than me because the, the great success of the book uh, corresponded to the great success of the person, Pietro Palladini, yeah. who was taken just like a saint. And I, I thought I, I had put in the novel the shames of Pietro Palladini, but readers generally didn't notice it. No. <laughs> so I wrote a second novel in which I explained where Pietro Palladini was, was worse than me. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but of course, he was, he was uh, not a paradigmatic man. Marco Carrera is uh, a hero of his time, yeah. you know? He is a, 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 an exemplary man, not because he's better than the others, but because he drinks his cup until the end. Uh, yeah. And uh, this makes him a hero. Yeah. One of the things you were saying that he, he differs from you, I mean, he's a better tennis player, he's a gambler, Marco Correa, and he's got this horrible uh, anger towards psycho analysis and psychiatrist as a whole because everybody around him in his life especially all the women in his life his his wife his 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 lover his daughter 
uh, everybody's got a psychoanalyst. So what, what's your point on psychoanalysis? Because to Marco, it's, it's huge. I mean, he, he hates it. What, what, what's your the opposite? I brought psychoanalysis in my family. I, I, ah. I, I really involved a lot. And, and you can check it in the book, in okay. my previous four books that are written during my experience in analysis. I, uh, I consider it one of the most important experiences in my life. Yeah. And, but I understand very well the position of Marco Carrera because I didn't have, I didn't have all these women in my life. I didn't have any sister. I just had a mother, of course, but uh, I had four sons and and in my family, Veronese family in, in, in the 20th century, we had just one woman, one female person, that is my, uh, my daughter in 2009. So in the whole 20th century, no women at all. Uh, and he has all these women around him. Everybody of, of them goes to the psychoanalysis. So I can understand a man who is uh, surrounded, assaulted by the someone else's analysis. And you know very well that you will be probably the object of exactly. their analysis. And you cannot do anything else than going to analysis yourself, exactly. just to fight. No, I and thought it was really funny. This. It was really funny because Marco is, is a very stable, centered kind of man. The only problem is that all the females in his surroundings when they talk to the psychiatrist and go to psychoanalysis, basically the conclusion of their sessions is it's all his fault. And he's yes. not even there. It's all the time. It's his fault. And I think that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful uh, analogy with what happens throughout his life. Basically here's this man like a colibri trying to remain still and hang in the air with how many flaps with the wings? Uh, a second? 70 per second. 70 to just remain motionless and still, but all the forces around him keep pushing him in all kinds of direction, just like all the women in his, uh, in his life. Um, also, there are some, um, in the beginning of the book, he meets the psychoanalyst of his wife, Marina, and he's called Daniele Caradori. And I think Mr. Caradori is one of the most wonderful characters of the whole book. He's, he's the man basically who will save in a way, yeah. Marco Carrera in the end. But also throughout your novel, uh, and it must have been tremendous fun inventing them, or maybe they're related to your own life, that you all, all have these all different kind of characters in the book. For instance, his friend from his childhood being named the unnameable. Um, I think, I don't know what's it, what it is in Italian, but in English it's the unnameable. He's yes, it's the, it's the translation of the unnameable. Yes. So why why not mention his name? Why Duccio, Duccio, the he, what his real name is? Why 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 this character, this this wonderful guy oh, who meets throughout his book? This is a sort of uh, concentration of different characters that we I don't know in the northern countries, just like Netherlands, probably you are more rationalist, but in in in, in Italy, wherever you live, in, no matter if you are in a great city or in a small uh, country village, there is a guy who is considered and uh, accompanied by the fame of being, uh, of bringing bad luck. Bad luck, the bringer of bad, bad luck. <laughs> so, you know, there is a literature in Italy about that. There is uh, oh, wow. a filmography. Uh, it is uh, the, the black dressed guy who brings bad luck, he's, uh, he's acknowledged, often he knows it, yeah. and sometimes he, he makes a job of this, just like this guy at the end of his life. But uh, the mechanism, when this, mm, this situation begins, it, it is very innocent. Uh, and yes, I remember, when I was uh, a boy, one of these cases starting with a boy, a friend of mine, who became 
for a while, the guy who was bringing bad luck wherever he, he went, so people avoided him. And we, we are talking about 15 years old guys. And I remember exactly what was the, the day this story began. And it is exactly what I tell in, this, in the story. It was in a ski race and uh, he, he, he said something before starting uh, about his competitor and his competitor had a terrible accident oh, wow. uh, finished. For that moment on, this guy, because there were few people, 10 people. I was not uh, present. No. That combination of, of, of words and facts chased him for the rest of his life. Yeah. Of course, the guy of the of the of the book, he is not my my friend. No. This is just the beginning. And then I composed a sort of, of concentration of all these guys, including a famous character of a Pirandello's novella yeah. that, that we, we read it at the secondary school. I also had to think, maybe you know the film, uh, the film The Cooler, the movie with William H. Macy. Did you ever see that? Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. so, yeah. Because that, that his job is to go to casinos and yes, because yes. He, he oozes bad luck, everybody in his vicinity yeah. just loses the game. So that's yeah, the kind yeah. of guy of the unnameable. But the irony, of course, also is that He's the bringer of bad luck for everybody, except for Marco, because he actually saves his life. And he yes. why he marries, he, he meets his wife and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this brings me to a very important center of your, of your book, that it's also a book about, about faith, about destiny maybe, and about the, the acceptance or um, the existence, I mean, of, of something called the free will, et cetera. Um, what, what, what is it with you personally? Do you, are, you, are you a free will person or are you a believer in fate, destiny, forces that will basically get you to the left and to the right without you being part of it? Or You know, I don't believe in God. No. If I was supposed to believe in something, I would believe in God much more than in this neutral conspiration of fate and uh, and other people will. I don't believe in God because I don't have the grace of the faith because I, I have nothing against uh, God if he does exist. And, of, and particularly, I have a sort of admiration and um, empathy um, with those who believe. Yeah, I I believe in them. I believe yeah. in people who believe in God, but I don't believe in God. So if I don't believe in God, it's difficult for me to believe in in something similar, smaller, not e explainable, not mm, demonstrable. Uh, because I prefer God. If I have to believe, I I I would prefer to believe in God and tradition and everything, Satan and all this. It's mm -hmm. well composed. Yep. It, 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 it's a better story. It's a great and story. Then, of course, it lasts since 2000 years. The gospel, I believe that uh, the success of gospel is, is, is given by the fact that it's a, a, a wonderful story. So yeah. I, I, I mostly believe or not believe in stories, you know, uh, and in characters of the stories. So I believe in Huckleberry Finn because I, have, I believe in the guy, in this guy who lives on and on throughout the book. Yeah. Um, and I know that it's, it is a strange way of believing, but it's my choice. I write because I, I gave my choice uh, to, the lit to literature. This is my my paradise, you know. I want I want to go there, and even if I don't have 
the, the talent and, uh, and, and the possibility of being there, uh, the, uh, just uh, teasing uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, the aspiration itself is for me um, enough yeah. for structuring my life, even without believing in some superior essence. Now, I think that's really beautifully put because um, in your writing, you sense, you, you find a certain grace in your writing in, in small details. For example, all throughout the book, you've got little examples of the intense freedom you have writing. For instance, Daniele Caradori, again, he was also a tennis player and he played together with Marco when they were young in the same, same tournaments and they played the same uh, uh, matches, etc., even against each other. And, and this allows you to bring someone like Ivan Lendl, one of the best tennis players of all time in his youth, into the book, uh, saying about Ivan Lendl that during a tournament, he only had one set of clothes. Yeah. And it was that he was handed different sets of tennis clothes by the by the people who organized the tournament, and and I think this small stories like this make the book so very rich and intense. And maybe in those kind of things, that particular kind of freedom lies your grace that you would otherwise find in the story of faith of of God and the gospel, etc. Is that something you would agree upon? That is that is that where you find your your own I totally agree because I, I, I really do believe in details. Yeah. And uh, uh, I remember that somebody said that devil live, lives in details. Indeed. Yeah. So in an undirected way, it seems that I believe in devil. But <laughs> I, I really do believe in details because details that can be also more structured than the episode you mentioned about Ivan Lendl. This yeah. is a story I, uh, I heard about. Ivan Lendl, very thin, unbeatable, at the, in Milan, uh, at the age of 17, he had just one shirt. Yeah. So they had to give, because he won, he won, he won till the end, and he needed a, a, a couple or three. Uh, but it was so, it was so, uh, strong the idea of, of, of a guy who was already even Lendl. He was demonstrating yeah. of being even Lendl, but he had no he had no no shirts to and, and people gave him not because they were charity but because they recognized that they had a guy a wonderful tennis player he could not stop because he was poor no? yeah. so they gave to him and this is a small detail, but in the book there is uh, an experiment. I don't know uh, uh, other writers who did this. It is a cover. It is, it is a, ve a, a veritable cover of someone else's short story. Yeah. A yeah. wonderful sh short story. The best short story, in my opinion, of the whole Italian tradition. That is uh, the, the correspondence of the chapter uh, that I don't know in uh, uh, in, in, in Dutch. Dutch, but in English is vertigos. Yeah, the dry kolken. This is the this is already written by Beppe Finoglio in nineteen in the fifties. Yeah, of course, with a totally different um, historical situation. It was a poor family in the northern Italy during the war. And uh, there is this small uh, boy, uh, almost a, chil a child, who had the, the, the revelation that his father, uh, who said to the whole family, I go down the river to, to take some, something, he wanted to commit suicide. Yeah. So he followed him until the river and the father didn't want him so they struggled a little bit and then they came back together so the children the, the child was sure he had saved his father's life i changed the characters marco carrera is a, 
is the, the, the boy, but uh, we are not talking about his father, we are talking about his elder sister. Yeah. Of course, it's the 70s in, in Italy, uh, not war, it's not a poor situation, but it was perfect because these, the whole, the whole uh, short story, is a detail, a wonderful, brilliant detail in the Italian uh, tradition. So wow. I thought I could do that. If I, if I confess this, and I do at the end of the book, that, that wonderful chapter is not, is not because of me, it's just the cover I made of a wonderful short story. Uh, this is another demonstration of what you, you were saying and agree. Um, I really do believe in all this uh, apparently peripheric uh, characters, situation or stories because, you know, uh, they are the structure yeah. of my... I, 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 I don't use... Even when I write in a chronological order, uh, so not this time, but normally I write in chronological order, I don't use any form of, of, of previous structure just to note down what will happen at what time. No, I go. Yeah. I go on. I can't go on. I go on. And this motto is present on my books since... 15 years uh, or 20 years. It's the fifth time I begin my book with this Samuel Beckett's motto. Because, of course, this is my... my if I'm not able to, to, to write a, a book, it, is, it has to be a tragedy. I, then, I don't want anything to save myself because I had structured the possibility of... No, it is a tragedy. If I can't go on and I don't go on, this is my my end of of, of, of of a writer. You understand? So living with this gun, this it's just like I remember uh, I talked with uh, Enzo Francescoli, the great uh, Uruguayan soccer player, after he won the America Cup in 1996. I had him beside me in the airplane, going back to Buenos Aires from Montevideo. He was, uh, he scored the final uh, free kick in the final against Brazil. So he was a hero. And, um, and I remember uh, Enzo Francisco Lee, he was God in that moment for, for, his, for his people and everything. And uh, I asked him, how do you feel, no? And uh, he was happy, but he was, what, what I feel is relief. Because if I didn't score that free kick, I would have lived normal life. I could have forgotten in, 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 in one month this program. I, I play in Argentina and River Plate, but all those people, all my country, all my people wouldn't have forgotten, never wouldn't have forgotten. So I take the responsibility and this was just like having a gun against my head. And we Uruguayan, we get better if we have a gun. We, if we see the gun that can kill us, we are better. Yeah. So uh, I'm quite that way, uh, except for the fact that if I fail my free kick, there is no <laughs> nation crying. You know, it's a, yeah. it's a personal <laughs> matter. <laughs> Thanks. Beautiful. Um, let me take you to, to a little bit further in the book. It's a very important part, of course, where actually, again, like Pietro Palladini, who he's left behind to take care of his girl, his, his, his daughter, Marco, 
basically is being left behind to take care of his granddaughter uh, with a beautiful name, Mirai Jin. Do I, do I pronounce it correctly? That's yeah. the person of the future uh, translated. And actually, he, he does see in her the embodiment of the future. She, she, he's got one job. Maybe that's also a gun against his head. That he's got the job to bring her into the world, to keep her safe and to deliver her. I, I think those are his exact words, to deliver her to the world. Um, and you're saying something very interesting because ex especially in these very uncertain times, it's very true, even now in the, with the coronavirus, you say that Miranji, uh, Mira Jin is, is choosing between uh, having to, to basically watch the battle of mankind between the truth and freedom. And she chooses truth, to fight for truth instead of freedom. There are so many people in our countries in the world are full of the, the, the freedom of free speech to say whatever you want, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, why, why is this battle so important to you? Why you wanted to describe this, this, this current battle that's even more present now during these weeks and months and I don't know how long it will uh, go of on. Of course, when I wrote this, I didn't have any no, idea exactly. of what could happen uh, all of a sudden everywhere in the world. It's almost but a prophecy, yeah. This, this is something that has uh, speeded up the process, but the process was already begun. Yeah. Uh, let me say something about Mirai Jean first, because she is really uh, the person of the future, the man of the future, because in Japanese, Mirai Jean means yeah. man of the yeah. future, and she's a, 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 a female. Uh, I don't know you, but I have uh, witnessed uh, the birth, with directly or not, the birth of dozens of kids for my, my kids and all my friends' kids in my life. I have received the new, I have visited at the hospital uh, dozens of newborn kids. And nobody, no mother or father, told me, look, this is the person of the future. In a way, they were, all they were. But yeah. nobody was presented to me as a person of the future for a simple reason. They weren't. So I imagined when there is, there is the person of the future, the new man, the new woman, coming to, 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 to this world, of course, of course, people will realize it immediately. Because, uh, you know, uh, already you, you are your father, you are your mother, so you, 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 you are fond of this little kid and you are able to believe to any story, good story about him or her. If he or she is the person of the future, it will be very clear, just like, uh, just like in, in, a, in a religious way, when Jesus uh, was born, when Jesus was born, was already known that he was Jesus, you know? So this is the idea. Uh, when, if it will happen, I hope, yes. When... The man of the future will will be born. We yeah, know. Will know it. It's not a coincidence. I'm talking about Marco Carrera because he has to do with the man of the future. Yeah. And um, about the struggle of, uh, between uh, truth and freedom, this is in Italy in the last three, four, five years. It's been the uh, the real thing because. Um, in the last 20 years, we, in Italy, we lived uh, and witnessed a, a strange and bad phenomenon, political phenomenon, that was the translation, the transformation of the word freedom yeah. in the word freedoms. And each freedom was distincted, was, 
was uh, separated from the others. So that you mean we can add no matter what freedom, just like a la carte in a restaurant. Give me a freedom of uh, not believing in political correct, not believing in, and this is a freedom. So yeah. we started to witness a conflict between, for example, now, saying this now, it seems really uh, absurd, but until last year, we had a struggle in, in the government in Italy, and in Italy, uh, among between uh, pro-vax and anti-vax vaccines. Yeah, in the government. Inside the government. Yeah. So, you know, because of very strange theories against vaccines that were mm, considered a, a, the demonstration if I am free, I can believe in whatever I want and being coherent to this. So I don't vaccine my daughter and you cannot impose me because I am free. I want to be free. The truth is that if there is not a mass vac vaccination, all those are weaker, they are in danger. I was not vaccinated when I was a child uh, against uh, all those uh, diseases that now are, are included in the vaccine. I didn't die because I was in good health. But I could, I could bring the disease yeah. to another yeah. child who was weak and who could not. And now we know that this is the truth. The truth is that we have, as a mass of people, to vaccine just to avoid to transmit the disease to those that are weaker now it, it it's it's really this was uh, a, 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 an argument inside the government now it's happening now it's happening because you know there are thousands of people who fall in the disease and go out yeah. without dying yeah. But the problem is that we couldn't protect the weakest people, old people and, and um, sick people with already some diseases. And, that, and, and so this is the demonstration that, okay, you are free. You are free. If you want to be free to go out during the lockdown, you want to, 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 to make a rave party during the lockdown, I... I deny, I deny your freedom because the truth is that if you do that, yeah. it is a, 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 a worse situation for everybody. Yeah. So this includes uh, a, a very political uh, way of, 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 of uh, uh, taking life, includes uh, the relationship with uh, words, Negroes, yeah. if I am free or not to say Negro, yeah. you are free to say Negro, but you have to know that now and not 50 years ago, it is an offense. Yeah. So if you use it, you use your freedom to offend somebody. So what you're saying, it's, it's, it's an abuse of freedom, in a way. Of course, it's an abuse of freedom because the, it's not a plural word. It's a singular word. Yeah. Freedom is one. People who died for freedom, they died for one freedom. That includes yeah. all the freedoms, but it's not the freedom of. Freedom yeah. is freedom. Exactly. And now, of course, we, we had this uh, problematic uh, spread of different freedoms, every one of them is uh, adored by some, somebody who don't want in any case to renounce. And if you, if you say, no, you can't, oh, you are killing my freedom, yeah. you know? And so I feel for the first time in my life, uh, 61 years old, to fight against freedom. <laughs> Yeah. Because I fight for, for truth, Strange. not freedom. Strange. I, 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 I face people in a political way 
who are shouting in my face that they want freedom. And I deny their freedom. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. And this is a strange situation, but it makes, it makes me thinking about how it's changing. The yeah. situation. Of course, this, this uh, unbelievable global experience would change things. Exactly. Uh, and probably what I'm talking about once uh, out of this emergency will be changed. But and you have, and, and you have, you seem to have, because it's Mira Jean we're talking about, she's the leader of this particular kind of future of, of, of the, the, the fighters for truth, is that you have a strong belief in, I mean, you have five children um, in youth, in, 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 in a new yeah. generation. Is that true? It is true. And uh, I was surprised, uh, even in this, I'm not, I've not been surprised on, on, uh, I was surprised and all of a sudden, out of blue, while I was writing about Mira Jean, this young girl leading people against the, voila, Greta Thunberg. She exactly. came out last year while I was yeah. writing. And, and I thought, yeah. no, I, I am writing about in 10 years. <laughs> this is a future. It's not the present. So uh, yeah. I had the demonstration I'm not a good science fiction writer because <laughs> I, was, I was thinking I, I was writing about the future and it was happening. Uh, oh, science fiction also plays an important role in your book. But we, we're, we haven't got time to talk about because I think we have some time for a few questions. If there are any questions, I'm looking at the Q&A, but I'm not sure at, at the moment. Uh, I'm not uh, seeing things yet. Sometimes they have to be transferred from YouTube or whatever. Um, so okay. So let's go back then. Maybe uh, we're nearing the end now, uh, uh, Sandro, to the... You, actually, you, you were writing science fiction, because, and science fiction is also a, an important part in the book, I was saying, because Marco's father was a very avid science fiction Reader, there was this 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 series of books he was collecting uh, uh, during his time, and I, I didn't know that series of book, but there was a series of very uh, famous science fiction uh, 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 kind of books. Are you are you a science fiction reader yourself? Do you do you do you like the genre? Do you? I was since my father was a, a science fiction collectioner. Uh, the first books I liked, I, I, I read at the age of 10, 11 were science book science fiction books that i i was finding uh for the uh, in the house my father was not a collectioner just like marco carrera father he spread out because it went they went out each 14 days it was just like a, a magazine yeah. it was actually a magazine uh, but they published all the classic science fiction live because it were, uh, we are talking about the 50s and the 60s and the 70s when actually all the great science fiction writers wrote these books now it is history but at that time it was something what, what, what it was happening i thought that we could use uh, this science fiction museum that is the collection of the books of Marco Carrera's father. Of course, all those books were talking about the future that never, never arrived. N no books of, of the whole collection of the science fiction books uh, looked in advance at the actual future that were uh, expecting us. Yeah. Nobody talked about the internet. The internet was was so by William Gibson in the 80s with the Cy Mona Lisa cyberpunk. And this was the first time uh, they had visions of, of, of another totally different uh, future that never uh, arrived. So we can, this collection of books, we can call it a sort of museum of the yeah. failed future. And I wanted to detect the story of the family, the past story of the family, uh, throughout the analysis of the missing books in this collection, because yeah. each uh, each uh, absence has 
a reason. precise reason. And this precise reason has a lot to do with the story of Marco Carrera and his brothers and his sister and family. So it, it, it was fun for me thinking that uh, the symbol of future science fiction books of the uh, half of the past century became uh, the museum of the of the story of, of, of the family because yeah. of the missing yeah, issues. It's a gorgeous structure, it's beautiful. And in correspondence to the science fiction, and maybe this is the last question, one of the participants will, is asking you, do you think that we are living the science fiction at this moment in time? Uh, that we are? That we, that we do live in a sort of science fiction story at this moment, at, at this time. Which it's, is weird. it's really surprising, but not for Bill Gates, as I know, because uh -oh. Bill Gates had already had two mantras. Uh, he, he, he made a layout of, of the situation that, is, that was really very close to the situation we so if nobody had uh, imagined this situation no it could not uh, uh, named as science fiction but since bill gates did yes it's it's a new science fiction and the author is bill gates yeah yeah well thank you we'll leave it at that um, thank you, Sandro. Um, I think we are at the end of our conversation. Really, thank you for taking your time to talk to me. And, and thank you, thank you. I hope you will be safe and stay healthy, and that we'll meet each other hopefully in The Hague, with crossing border, or somewhere else in the world. And yes, meantime, I'm, I'm fond of crossing border. I'm fond of crossing hope border. Hope to see you there. I, again. I will come whenever I will be invited. Okay. Thank you so much, Sandro. Ciao. Take thank care. You. Bye-bye. Ciao.